Bible with you? How about holding it up and letting me see it? Amen? Great. I'm so glad that you carry your Bible to church. Now, some of you may not know that Brother Jesse's mom and dad are missionaries to China. They went to the field in what uh, year, Jesse? 94. And uh, I uh, came back as pastor uh, when they came here, and we took them on as missionaries, and we've supported them ever since. And they're a fine couple and serving the Lord there in China. So be much in prayer uh, for them, if you will. And Jesse, of course, is praying about God's will for his life. He's studying to be a physician down at uh, uh, MUSC. And you're in your last year, is that right, Jess? In, his fa in the last year, so we'll be praying for him. Now, listen, a lot of our folk, and especially our seniors, are not coming out because of the virus. They're still concerned about it, and uh, so I'm not going to argue with them. Uh, they need to keep themselves safe. They, I'll, I'll pray for them, and I know that you will, too. Now, I trust that you'll be back with us in the evening service, 6 o'clock on Sunday evening, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening, and I trust that you will uh, uh, be with us. And uh, tonight, I want to talk to you about what heaven means to me. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you know me on a shadow of a doubt? If you died today, you'd go to heaven. Let's see your hand. Shout it out. Amen? All right. Now, how many of you can stand and tell me what you're going to be doing when you get up there? Robert? Yeah. I'm building stuff right next to Jesus. Amen. Did you hear that? I love him and his wife, but he's been nothing but trouble ever since he's been here for me. So you pray for him that the Lord will speak to his heart. Amen? <laughs> All right. Well, we do love him and we appreciate him. And, uh, you have guests with you today, don't you? All right. Would you stand and introduce yourself and let us know? you. God bless you. Amen. Uh, sir, I, I am a counselor. I have I can counsel you today and later on if you'd wish and maybe help you out just a little bit. I just want you to know that that's there for the offer if you'd like to have it. <laughs> All right. Let's stand for a word of prayer if you will, please. But seriously, a lot of our faithful people are uh, staying home watching uh, by way of uh, our internet or whatever you call it, and we're getting all kinds of responses back, and uh, I'm not technical like you folk are, uh, but anyway, the word's going out. All right, let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for our dear friends that are here this evening or this morning. We thank you for our guests that are here, and I just pray that this time together in the word will be a blessing to us and that you'll speak to our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in Acts chapter 2, and you may be seated, Acts chapter 2, I want to talk to you about seven secrets of a growing church. Seven secrets of a growing church. We'll begin in Acts 2, and we'll begin in verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now, let me stop there and just give a little bit of a <clears throat> quick explanation. Uh, he's not saying here that Jesus went to the lake of fire. Uh, before the resurrection, the uh, place where people went when they died had a, a division. One was called hell, and one was called paradise. And in the Old Testament, when saints died, they went to paradise, and the unsaved people went to a place called hell. Now, the saints were taken out of paradise when Jesus rose from the dead, and the Bible says hell has enlarged itself. But at the rapture and at the revelation in the days ahead, when Jesus comes to take us home, the unsaved people will be taken out to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, judged for their sins, and then cast into the uh, lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Now that's why we need to be busy telling people about salvation, amen, and preaching the gospel and witnessing to them. 
And so Jesus died for us that we might have everlasting life. Now look at verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, <clears throat> whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now let me say a little word about 30 verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now the Church of Christ teaches that baptism saves you. You go into the water and you come back up out of the water and the water has washed away your sins. And they use this verse to preach that. But my friends, that's not uh, what this says. What it's saying is, first of all, repent. That's the first thing. Repentance is what saves you. But then you're baptized publicly to give a public announcement of what has happened to you. You go down into the waters, pictures that your old man is dead and gone buried in the depths of the sea, and then raised to walk in newness of life. A new nature has come into the life of the believer. So you see, he's not talking about water baptism that saves you. He's talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And that pictures that as we were baptized. Then in verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And remember, the Holy Spirit would come up on people before this time, but now uh, he comes up on the believer when he's saved and remains with us, and that's a great thought. Verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And uh, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now watch this. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and of prayers. Now I want you to notice those two verses. When a man is generally born again, when a woman is genuinely born again, they're not going to get saved and get lost, get saved and get lost. They're saved forever. But notice what the sign was that they had been truly born again. They were saved, they were baptized, but notice what he said. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. Now, we may fail the Lord, we may have disappointments, we may be disappointed. There might be a period of, our t of time that we're not serving him as we should, uh, but that does not mean that you're lost. It means that you're a believer. We have our ups and our downs, but he will save forever. Aren't you glad of that? And it's not your good works, not my good works, but it is knowing him and serving him him. Verse 44, And all that believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. 
and they continuing daily, watch that now, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Now verse 47 again, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now I'm talking to you about seven secrets of a growing church. Now I'm sure that uh, you would say, as a member of this church, you would like to see it grow. God has been good to us uh, down through the months, and we've had people added to the church uh, by baptism, by joining the church, uh, and so forth, by letter. And, of course, uh, uh, we've had a lot of people staying at home because of this. But I want our church to grow. I think you do, too. And so here is a good trestise of a church that grew and grew steadily and grew strong and made a big difference in the area where they live. Now let's ask ourselves that question this morning as members of Gospel Light Baptist Church. Are you set and am I set for the salvation of souls? Is that a mindset of yours? When you walk out of here this morning, is it still in your mind, I need to witness to somebody? I've come to church. We've uh, fellowshiped. We sang the songs of Zion. We've opened the Bible. And uh, we have prayed, and the preacher preached to us. So now I'll just go home, and that's it. I hope that's not your outlook. I hope that's not your thoughts. You see, when God saved these people, what did he tell them to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen? Now, obviously, I can only take the gospel to the people across the street over there. I can only take the gospel to folk that are around here. Now, most of you know that every Saturday uh, I get our packet and I go out in the community and I put them on the door or I'll put them on the car or, or whatever and I'll do that pretty briskly and then I'll go to an area and I'll, I'll go door to door or I may go down to the mall and just go around the mall and give out tracts and talk people that are sitting down or just standing around and I'll walk up to them and I'll say good afternoon. I'm Robert Boofer. I'm pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church and I just want to know if you have a church to go to. And I'll take out our church card and I'll say I'd like to give you this card. And I'll say the plan of salvation is on the back of it. And I, there's, all, uh, there's uh, how you can get to the church, the phone number and all of this. And then I'll say it to him and I'll say, by the way, sir, do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? And they'll say, well, yes. And then I'll say, well, how do you know? Tell me how you know. Give me a scripture passage. Let me know how. And some of them will give a good statement. Some will not. And then some will say, no, I'm not saved. Well, could I take my New Testament and show you how to be saved? And 98% of them will say, no, I'm not interested. But you try to do your best. Amen? And always be looking for someone to witness to. Ask God to lay somebody upon your heart that's lost. I have people that I have their names that are written down and every night and every morning and in the middle of the day I pray for those names and those names are in my, in my brain and they're there uh, but sometimes I'll go down one by one and just call out their names in prayer sometimes I'll do it by memory what am I saying? I'm saying God has saved us not just to sit around. He saved us to take the gospel to the man across the street, the woman across the street, and across the, the world and the nations. Amen? So, seven secrets of a growing church. Uh, in this passage of Scripture, it's very, very clear that it's really no secret. The Lord has given us the pattern for having a growing church. But what keeps a church from growing? What keeps it from being what God would have it to be? Well, you reckon it's lack of interest. Lack of interest. I know people that will go to church and they'll bring their Bible maybe. Maybe they won't bring their Bible and they'll sit there and they'll just sit through the service and then they get up and they're gone. That's the extent of it. 
That's the extent of it. Uh, they're not really that interested. They know they should go to church, but they're not really that interested, but they want, they, they want to be in good with the Lord somehow. And so they walk out the door and never think about him, probably, mostly, or read their Bible until the next Sunday. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Okay. Pray with me that God will make us, you and I, more so conscious than we've ever been. Are you watching what's going on in the world today? Are you listening? Are you taking close, uh, paying close attention to what's going on and what could happen any moment around the world? China now, think about what's going on in China. And this country seems to be having a lot of associations with China, but China is a dangerous, dangerous country now. And we're hearing that, and we're hearing that we're told that we need to be very, very conscious of that. We don't need to lose a lack of interest in coming to church. We need to take a solid interest in being in the house of God and serving the Lord together. And then the second thing maybe that's holding us back is worldliness. Worldliness. The devil knows how to use the world to call a Christian. The world advertises. The world advertises all of the time. Uh, just go in a bookstore. Go in a bookstore. Uh, I'll go in the bookstore down here, books a million, uh, when I go for my walk in the mall every day, and I'll go through and witness to some folk in there, and I'll leave tracks there. Uh, for for folk, and I had two young men come to me one day a few weeks ago, and asked me not to do that. And I said, well, "Let me ask you a question: Is there a law against what I'm doing?" Well, no, sir, but that's religious. That's why they said, "But that's religious." I said, "So, well, we have freedom of religion in the United States." Well, yes, sir, but well, why? Well, we just think. And I said, okay, let me ask you this. If, by giving out these tracts, one man or one woman got saved and went to heaven as a result of that, wouldn't you be thankful, wouldn't you be glad that they found that track in your bookstore and were on their way to heaven? Whatever I said just went right through their brain and on out the backside. But I said to them, now, are you certain that there's no law against this? And of course, I already knew it. I already checked it out. Now, that's what you want to face. You're in a world that's against church, they're against the Bible, and they're against the Lord. And they're adamant about it, and they're not ashamed to take it public. These guys didn't care to take it public in the bookstore, and a lot of people were standing around listening to us. So I should not be ashamed to take the gospel across the street. Amen? So I'm asking you this morning, why is it that the church is not on fire? Why is it that we're not doing what the apostles did? Lack of interest. Worldliness. The world has come into the church. I had a friend of mine, and I, uh, I, uh, about two weeks ago, I guess it was, told me uh, that after church here, they had to rush down and pick up something there uh, in the mall, and that they had gone by one of these uh, modern-day uh, churches, and he said he had to stop and listen. He said, I couldn't believe it. It was like a rock and roll concert in there, and people dancing all over the place and uh, acting like a, a honky-tonk. And he said, I couldn't wait to get away from there. Now, I'll leave that up to whatever you were thinking, uh, but uh, I don't want things to be real hushed and quiet in here. I want you to enjoy coming to church. Sing out, amen? Give a word of testimony. Put a smile on your face. Let the people know that you're born again, amen? And we want, we want that to be happy and joyful, but we want it to be biblical. If you want to give a testimony, give it. Uh, you, you see what I'm saying? So uh, we don't want worldliness to creep in. Now, this last one may be one of the most very important that I want to say to you. We need unity. We need unity, working together. Now, I want to ask you to pray that prayer every day, if you will. Lord, give our church unity. 
uh, Sunday school classes. I thank God for the uh, classes that's going on in the back now. I thank the Lord for those folk. And I thank the Lord for you. All right. I want you to pray for me that I'll be a better witness. I want to pray for you that you will be a better witness as well. Now, let me give you some thoughts this morning concerning this matter of seven secrets of a growing church. Number one, perseverance. Perseverance. Just staying at it. Just staying at it. Dr. Lee Robertson would stand in the pulpit at Highland Park Baptist Church. The church was in something like five, 6,000 people. And uh, he'd always keep saying, it takes three to thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Get yourself prepared for when you get out into the world and be a witness and lead people to the Lord. And, and uh, people that are hurting, you can reach out to them. And I can remember him saying that again and again and again and again. And he was staying at it. And I remember him saying this. He would look at this congregation of students at uh, Tennessee Temple University on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Thursday, and Friday. And then, of course, when uh, if you were a member, if you were taking classes at Temple, uh, you had to go to Highland Park for the first year and be in that environment and so forth. And I'm glad that I did. After that, you could go to another church. That one year at Highland Park, I learned a lot about the ministry. I learned a lot about preaching. Dr. Lee Robertson was one of the most avid soul winners that I've ever met in my life. Tremendous pastor. And he had a presence in the pulpit, a presence that just made you want to do something. Just made you want to get out of there and, and do something. And I appreciated him so, so much, so much. And then I took... Uh, the pastor of our church, the church I grew up in, Pleasantdale Baptist Church uh, in Evansville, Tennessee, and I became the pastor. It had closed down while I was away at college. We went back and, and we opened it up and we picked up some people. And so I wanted Dr. Robertson to come and preach. And he came and preached. Preached at that little church just like he did at Highland Park. Uh, just the very same. And after everybody had left, it was just uh, Sue and I, and Dr. Robertson was there, and he's ready, getting ready to go back to Chattanooga. And he looked at me, and he said, Bob, I see what you've got. I see what you've got. And I knew what he was saying. I was standing in front of the church, but in front of me was a dirt road, a dirt road. It had not been paved. And uh, that church had been there for a long, long time, and it stayed about the same, 75 members, and that was about, about it. But he said, Bob, I see what you've got, but he said, don't let that bother you. If God's put you here, stay at it and just keep going. And God did bless us. And it wasn't long that we were supporting missionaries. And then I left and took another church, and Sue and I went away to an old church that we knew of, and, uh, and, and I pastored it there, and that church kept on going kept on going, uh, kept, kept on taking on missionaries and people getting saved. Now, what am I saying? Perseverance. Just stay at it. If you're a soul winner, if you're a witness, just stay at it. Don't let the devil trick you in thinking that, uh, well, I can give it up. This is not that important. Important, No. Um, there's tracks out there. Uh, there's God's simple plan of salvation tracks. And then there's our um, uh, track that we give out, the little, the little card uh, that's out there. Get them and give them away. And you get an opportunity to witness. Just stay at it. Just stay at it. Stay at it. Press toward the mark of the prize. Amen? What about Philippians chapter 3? I press toward the mark of the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul said. And that's why I believe when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we see the Apostle Paul standing there before the Savior, I have it in my mind that we'll hear the Lord say to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Will he say that to me? Will he say that to you? If he says to you and to I, well done, good and faithful servant. And I hear him say, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Now, that's not going to make me proud in the sense of worldly pride. Amen? But my heart's going to be filled with pride because I obeyed the Lord. And I looked in his eyes and I saw the nail prints in his hand, the scar on his side. And he, uh, I forget, the, Dr. Charles Waggle wrote the song, He Died for Me. 
I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood. And that song goes on and talks about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and all of that. And Dr. Charles Weigel sang that song, preached the word of God. And God used him, listen now, God used him up until 93 years of age. And he witnessed in Chattanooga at 93 years of age. And he'd go down the streets of Chattanooga singing, no one ever cared for me like Jesus just to get somebody to come up and he would witness to them. What am I saying? Perseverance, just staying at it. What did Paul say in Timothy? I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give me at that day and not to me only but all those that love his appearing. Now a question for me and a question for you. Do you love his appearing? Wayne Williams, my pastor when I was a kid, I'd hear him make this statement all the time in church. He'd look at the congregation and he would say this. He would say, right now in your mind, right now in your mind, think about this. When you're in heaven, and you're standing before the Lord, what will go through your mind? Now, I bring that up again for this reason. I want to hear him say, well done. I don't want him to be ashamed of me. And I don't want to let a lack of perseverance keep me away from that. I want to be able to say, and I want the Lord to know that I fought a good fight. Now, do I fail? Absolutely. Do I get tired? Absolutely. Do I get upset? Absolutely. Do I get discouraged? Absolutely. Sometimes Sue and I sit down. We pray together, but sometimes we sit down and we just do this, do this, do, uh, talk about what's going on in our life, in our Christian life. And we just be very honest with one another. She's honest with me. I'm honest with her. We just talk about what's going on. And she's talking about what's going on, and I will, and then she prays for me and what's going on in my life. Listen, just because a man's a pastor and just because you've been preaching all of these years that I have, uh, 66, 67 years I've, I've been preaching the, the gospel, the devil hates me just like he hates you. And he wants to do everything that he can from keeping us from taking the gospel to the world. Perseverance, just staying at it, number two. Prayer. Prayer. If you're going to persevere, you're going to have to be a man or a woman of prayer. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Now, what does that mean? It means be in an attitude of prayer all the time. Be in an attitude of prayer all the time. Husbands, pray for your wives. Wives, pray for your husbands. Mom and dad, pray for your kids. We want our children's program to grow. Now we've got some sickness in our church with some of the kids and some of the ladies that bring them here. They'd be here, would have been here this morning, but because of sickness and that they're going through, they're not able to be here this morning. But we want to see our kids saved. Amen? We want to see them grow. And that's going to take all of us working together, but it's going to take prayer. What does, what does the Bible say about this matter of prayer and how important it is? Ephesians 6.18 praying always in all prayer and supplication and supplications praying always with all prayer and supplications I try to pray I say I said three times a day and then when I think that it's very, very more important for me to pray about a situation then I'll do that as well we need to be men and women of prayer did you pray for our church this week did you pray for me did you pray for Brother Jesse that the songs that he would choose would be just the ones that you would need for your heart this morning? Now, we listen with our ears, but really we listen more with our heart, shouldn't we? We really should listen more with our heart. And if we do that, you know what the Lord will say to us? Here's this little item you need to get rid of. Here's this little attitude that you've got that you need to quit, stay away from. Remember what you said to that person? Remember how you treated that person? You need to go to them and get it straightened up. 
keep close accounts with the Lord. I don't know of anything more that will keep me closer to the Lord than to just be a man of prayer. You see, back in Leviticus 6.13, I'll not take time to go back and read it, but Leviticus 6 and chapter 13, the Bible says that uh, uh, this altar was constantly burning. The altar was constantly burning. We as Christians should be constantly burning. Don't you believe that? Burning for the Lord. Our church should be burning for the Lord all of the time. And we do it in prayer. And once again, we need to be in an attitude of prayer at all times. Then we need to pray seriously, consciously, pray out loud, pray privately. One famous pastor, and I, his, his name escapes me, but Dr. Robertson gave a testimony of this man. He was preaching for him in his church up north. Dr. Robertson was preaching for this man, a large church, people being saved constantly. He said that when he got there on campus that uh, the uh, people that escorted him to the, uh, to the church and to the, where the man studied in his study, his office back there, and they said, well, Dr. Robertson said he's uh, back there praying right now, and he said that he'll be out in a little while, but he said he usually prays for an hour, hour and a half. And he said, why don't you go back and sit down just outside the office and wait for him to come out. If you need anything to eat, we'll bring it to you. Dr. Robertson said, all right. And he said, he went back and sat down. And he said, all of a sudden, I heard a man praying out loud. And he said, I had never heard such praying in all of my life. He said, I could tell the man was very sincere. He was broken hearted for the lost. He could hear him weeping. Then he hear him praying again. And Dr. Robertson said, you know what I need to do? I'm on holy ground. I don't think I can stay here. I've got to just get up and leave. And then he said, no, this is holy ground. And so he said, I had to see what was going on. Now listen to this. That pastor in the uh, Chicago area, Dr. Robertson opened the door. The man was on his knees, and he had one of these big office chairs holding it over his head like that and praying. And he kept praying. And Doc said, I've had all I can take of this. I can't, I can't take this. He said, I had to go out, get in my car, and ask God to forgive me for being so lackadaisical about winning souls, for not really being serious about prayer. And Dr. Robertson said, I've had things happen to me that changed my life, but that changed my life. When I saw that pastor that most people all over the United States heard it as a great preacher, and he considered himself nothing. Dr. Robertson said that you talk to him privately, he would say, look, I'm nothing without the Lord Jesus. I'm nothing without the Holy Spirit. That's why God used him. Boy, don't you wish we had a lot of men like that today? Don't you wish we had a lot of women like that today? Just really serious. I want to get the gospel out to as many people as I can. And I pray that you do too. Now, members of this church, pray for one another and pray for this church. And so we talk about perseverance. We talk about prayer. And then the third thing and the last thing I'll mention is proclamation. Proclamation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now that's coming from the Apostle Paul. And uh, th this matter of proclamation, uh, I'm not ashamed. Write down Romans uh, 1 and verse 16. And uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And those will be verses that I think that will absolutely stir your heart uh, and move you along uh, for uh, the glory of God. Men that have made the most impact on my life have been men of prayer. They're the men that has made the most impact on my life. 
I'd like to reciprocate and do the same. How about you? Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed, please?